The International Space Station has been occupied since the year 2000. Its primary role is science, but just keeping it functioning is an immense task. This is Freedom 7, the fuel is go, 1.2 G, cabin at 14 PSI. In May 1961, Alan Shepard had flown a brief suborbital hop in his Freedom 7 space capsule. The Redstone booster that had launched Shepard was not capable of lifting a heavy spacecraft to orbit. The flight caused celebration in America, but by comparison, the first man in space, Russia's Yuri Gagarin, had completed a full Earth orbit and he'd become an international celebrity. The newly formed American Space Agency, NASA, had been charged with closing the space technology gap with its communist adversary, the Soviet Union. And Project Mercury was the means for achieving this. Until the more powerful Atlas booster was ready, the only rocket Project Mercury had was the Redstone, and NASA was keen to refine the Mercury capsule, so a second suborbital flight was scheduled. This time, the astronaut would be Gus Grissom. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all Less than That's three weeks after Shepard's flight, America's president Impact made a decisive contribution. On the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. At NASA, the training program and the preparation for the second Mercury flight with astronaut Gus Grissom continued as scheduled. But administrators realized that their president's announcement would mean a rapid expansion of the space agency. New staff were hired and long-term contracts were negotiated. Of immediate importance were modifications to the Mercury capsule. At the astronaut's request, a window was added and a new hatch, using explosive bolts, had been designed for quicker egress. Seventy bolts held the hatch in place, but these now had an intentional weak point and a small explosive charge would blow off the hatch if required. Gus Grissom would be the first to fly with the new hatch. It could be triggered from both inside and outside the capsule. On the morning of July the 21st, 1961, another Redstone rocket was being fueled. Since Yuri Gagarin's orbital flight in April, nothing had been heard from the Russians, and the Mercury team could feel they might be catching up to their communist adversaries. Weather had already caused this flight to be postponed three times. Grissom had named his Mercury capsule Liberty Bell 7. Confusingly, all Mercury spacecraft had the number 7 because there were seven astronauts. This mission was similar to Alan Shepard's flight, lasting around 15 minutes, with most important events happening automatically. However, the thruster control system had been modified, but Grissom would have less than three minutes to test it. The launch tower rolled back after a half hour delay. One of the hatch bolts was misaligned and it took engineers some time to conclude that the remaining 69 bolts would be enough. Three, two, one, zero. Uh, Roger, this is Liberty Bell 7. The clock is operating. Testing the manual thruster control, Grissom found it more sluggish than the ground-based simulator. On changing to the new rate command control system, he found it worked well, but was heavy on fuel. All too quickly, he was preparing for re-entry on what had seemed a perfect flight. 
Aircraft in the landing area picked up a radio beacon that started when the capsule's parachutes deployed. Helicopters soon found Liberty Bell 7 floating right on target. Everything appeared normal. Inside the capsule, Grissom had released the safety catch on the hatch. Not long after, the explosive charge blew the hatch open and the craft began filling with water. Grissom had to jump clear and the helicopter was struggling to lift the water-filled capsule clear of the waves. Warning lights in the chopper indicated the engine had been overtaxed and that failure was imminent. The pilot dumped the capsule, which sank beneath 5,000 metres of the Atlantic. Grissom had been struggling to stay afloat too, and he was winched to safety in a water-filled spacesuit. The loss of the capsule and its valuable data was not good, and immediately engineers began asking how the hatch could blow on its own. Grissom was adamant that the hatch had blown by itself. While he was still soaking wet, and with doctors trying to examine him, he took a congratulatory call from President Kennedy. Gus Grissom's suborbital flight would be the last Mercury mission to use the underpowered Redstone booster. Project Mercury planners wanted their next astronaut to go into orbit, but there was a problem. The more powerful Atlas booster they were relying on only had a 30% success rate. Designed in 1955, the Atlas was developed as a nuclear weapons delivery system but by 1961, the technology had not matured. It was not dependable. At this point, NASA had launched three unmanned Mercury-Atlas combinations, and two had failed catastrophically. NASA was beginning to argue with Convair, the rocket's builders, about reliability. Modifications, including a thicker skin and a transistorized telemetry system, were introduced. Soviet Union launched Vostok 2. Newspaper headlines tell the story. Hermann Titov of Russia returns to Earth after orbiting the globe 17 times in a little more than 25 hours, covering 435,000 miles, which is more than twice the distance from the Earth to the Moon. An orbit by a U.S. astronaut is planned later this year. His name was Enos, and just as Chimpanzee Ham had tested the first Mercury Redstone, Enos would test the Mercury Atlas. NASA gave all its really dangerous missions to chimpanzees. In November 1961, Enos blasted off. He orbited twice in three hours and 20 minutes and, although it wasn't a flawless mission, it gave the planners confidence that most of the glitches had been eliminated from the Mercury-Atlas combination. The next Mercury mission would carry John Glenn. He would be America's first man to orbit the planet. The flight had been scheduled for January the 16th, 1962. But technical issues and then problems with the weather meant that the launch had been delayed till February the 20th. For the US, this was an important mission. It would show that they were catching up with the Russians, who had clearly demonstrated their capability for long-term orbital flights. People had turned out along the beaches of central Florida to watch the launch, and national pride was on the line. The Cold War had reinforced Stars and Stripes patriotism, and John Glenn, in the spacecraft he had named Friendship 7, was striking a blow for truth, justice and the American way. 
Godspeed, John Glenn. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Roger, the clock is operating. We're underway. Everything about the launch was close to flawless. Okay. A little bumpy along about here. Five and a half minutes after blast-off, Friendship 7 was in orbit, and mission control affirmed that the trajectory was good for at least seven orbits. There was a minor problem with thrusters, but when a faulty sensor indicated that the spacecraft's heat shield had come loose, it was decided to bring the mission to a close after just three orbits. Capsule turning around, and I could see the booster during turnaround just a couple... Three days after his return at a ceremony at the Manned Spacecraft Center, the President decorated John Glenn with NASA's Distinguished Service Award, and across the US, support for the Manned Space Program was enthusiastic. There were three more manned orbital flights in the Mercury Program, each one increasing in duration, refining techniques and technology. Ultimately, the last scheduled Mercury missions were cancelled in favour of the next program. NASA was in a race to the moon and Project Gemini was a big step in that direction. Since the beginning of rocket launches, Engineers have used an array of cameras to monitor their craft's behaviour, and as rocket technology has developed, so have the cameras. A typical shuttle launch was monitored by 135 different cameras. Fixed cameras, shooting at 400 frames per second, capture both the solid fuel boosters and the rocket engines so that any anomalies can be scrutinised in detail after the launch. Other units surround the pad area to record the launch from every conceivable angle. In the period leading up to liftoff, when access to the launch complex is limited, the cameras play a vital role in continuous pre-flight inspections. Another group called the Final Inspection Team is equipped with handheld cameras. They have close access to the pad and launch gantry. Anything out of the ordinary is recorded for further scrutiny by a team of specialists at the launch centre. In addition, the launch management team can request images of any subsystem that might be returning suspect readings. The team can identify and photograph problems that may otherwise go unnoticed. When a spacecraft leaves the ground, a different set of tracking cameras continue to record. There are 17 medium-range trackers near the perimeter of the launch zone and at least 21 long-range trackers. These telescopic units run both high-definition video and 35mm film. They're essentially radar-controlled with fine adjustment via a joystick so sensitive it can pick up the operator's heartbeat. On the 16th of January 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia blasted off into a clear blue sky. 83 seconds after liftoff, a chunk of insulating foam broke off from the external tank, hitting the shuttle's left wing. It was picked up by two of the tracking cameras. Though the foam is very light, the incident happened when Columbia was travelling at about 800 kilometres per hour. The crew of seven was lost when Columbia broke up during re-entry two weeks later. An investigation revealed that foam strikes had been seen before. The normalisation of deviants was responsible for not having fixed the problem earlier. Shuttle flights were grounded and images from the tracking cameras led to a redesign of the external tank's insulation. 
Future shuttle flights, with one exception, were restricted to the International Space Station. Upon arrival, each shuttle was required to perform a gradual flip, allowing cameras on the ISS to capture images of the craft's thermal tiles. Any damage revealed would mean astronauts could wait at the station for a return to Earth on a later flight. But such precautions only revealed the vulnerabilities of the ageing shuttle and the fleet was retired in 2011, leaving the United States without a human-rated spacecraft. In a field that relies upon cutting-edge technology, the 30-year-old shuttles could no longer be updated. But a new system is on the way, the Orion, with every stage of testing and development being meticulously recorded. The International Space Station serves as a research and observation platform in the weightless environment of low Earth orbit. It has been continuously occupied since Expedition Crew 1 took up residence in the year 2000. The ISS has a mass of 450,000 kilograms, easily making it the largest man-made object in orbit. The space station had its origins in the Russian Mir-2. It was intended as a replacement for the aging Mir space station that had been in orbit since 1986. Launched by the Soviet Union, the original Mir had deteriorated badly toward the end of its 15-year life. The International Space Station's first component was the Zarya module, originally intended as the first piece of Mir-2. The US had a proposal for Space Station Freedom and the European Space Agency were planning the Columbus Space Station, but the prohibitive cost of such ventures led to a consolidation of the different schemes. The Space Shuttle became vital in the orbiting construction project. The second component was American. Known as the Unity Module, it was added in 1998. Over 13 years, the space station took shape. Russian Proton and Soyuz rockets, as well as the shuttle, all delivering components. The last shuttle flight ever, in 2011, was to deliver a European multi-purpose logistic module. At that point, it consisted of 15 pressurised segments and a truss assembly that anchors the solar arrays and the cooling radiators. Even so, the ISS remains unfinished with both a European robotic arm and a Russian multi-purpose laboratory still to be delivered. The Russian modules could all dock automatically, but a considerable amount of construction work was carried out by astronauts based in the station. Even after the building work finished, regular maintenance and running repairs require mission specialists to go outside. One of the last features to be added was the cupola, which includes the space station's largest window. Views are astounding. As the ISS travels over polar regions, the northern and southern auroras show as iridescent bands in the upper atmosphere. This is an indication of high solar activity, with the solar wind showering the Earth in charged particles. Generally, as the ISS is in a low Earth orbit, solar activity does not present a health hazard to the space station crew, as they are shielded by the Earth's magnetic field, which deflects all but the most intense ejections from the Sun. However, when solar flares are detected, the crew must shelter in the Russian orbital segment, which has shielding to protect against increased radiation. Even so, ISS crew members in one day receive as much radiation as a person on Earth will get in a year.
Periodically, partner nations will launch a resupply ship to the ISS. Since 2009, Japan's aerospace agency JAXA has sent four White Stork cargo craft. ESA has sent five automated transfer vehicles, which dock automatically and remain at the station for around six months. Since the retirement of the Space Shuttle, the United States has used commercial contractors for resupply. Like the Japanese ship, SpaceX's Dragon cargo craft will come alongside and wait to be captured by the station's robotic arm. The most frequent visitor is the Russian workhorse, the Soyuz, used for ferrying crew members and its cargo equivalent, the Progress. These also dock automatically. Two Soyuz craft stay at the ISS for emergency evacuation. With the arrival of a new cargo craft, the ISS crew are kept busy unloading and stowing new provisions. Ultimately, the cargo capsule is filled with waste and jettisoned. Long-term exposure to microgravity leads to loss of muscle mass and bone density, and daily exercise is important in reducing the health implications of weightlessness. Outside routine duties in keeping the space station functioning, the astronauts' regular work is science. This can be anything from monitoring plant and simple animal specimens being raised in microgravity to the search for dark matter via the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. At the end of their six-month stay on the ISS, three of the cosmonauts cram into the waiting Soyuz capsule and prepare for the journey back to Earth. Three and a half hours after the craft undocks, the cosmonauts will be on the ground in Kazakhstan. Major partners America and Russia cannot agree on funding for continued operations beyond 2020, which could mean the end of the orbiting laboratory. Gemini was the brief but intense interim program where NASA pioneered rendezvous maneuvers needed for lunar missions. In 1963, Project Mercury had come as far as the technology would allow. The final three missions were cancelled so that NASA could shift focus to a new program and develop the techniques needed to reach the moon. It was decided that before embarking on the three-man Apollo program, as had been intended, an intermediate stage to learn about orbital rendezvous and docking was needed. It was in Houston that Mr. Kennedy emphasized the need for peaceful uses. It was called Project Gemini, and in many ways, the new program's capsule was more advanced than the Apollo spacecraft that would follow it. It was designed for a two-man crew, and astronauts referred to it as the Gusmobile because Mercury veteran Gus Grissom had played a major role in its development. The Gemini spacecraft would have the ability to change its orbit, and it included instrumentation and systems that were borrowed from jet fighters. One of its most revolutionary features was its onboard computer. It had a memory of just 20 kilobytes. At the beginning, it was proposed that the Gemini capsule wouldn't have landing parachutes, but a regalo wing. Grissom was involved in the early tests before this idea was abandoned. It added a layer of complexity that couldn't be easily accommodated in the capsule's design, and NASA reverted to the traditional water landing. To boost the Gemini spacecraft to orbit, NASA hastily adapted the US Air Force's Titan II missile. The Titan II had a much simpler design because it used hypergolic propellant which could remain stored in the rocket for long periods. The two fuel components didn't have to be kept at sub-zero temperatures, but they were extremely toxic and dangerous to handle. Designers understood that any launch mishap wouldn't cause the large explosion seen with liquid oxygen, so they dispensed with the launch escape system used in the Mercury program 
and equipped the Gemini capsule with ejector seats. Of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, only Grissom, Shirar and Cooper remained with the rest, having left NASA or having been suspended for medical reasons. To bolster its core of space pilots, NASA took in a second group of nine astronauts in 1962 and another 14 the following year. Before the astronauts could fly, the Gemini-Titan combination had to be tested to demonstrate its reliability. The booster was prone to rapid variations in thrust, known as pogo oscillations. Modifications were made to the rocket and unmanned flights of Gemini 1 and 2 were made in 1964 and 1965. Mercury veteran Gus Grissom and new recruit John Young would fly the first manned Gemini mission. Because the Gemini craft was fitted with ejector seats, they had special training exercises that involved parachuting into the water. The two astronauts also spent long hours in the Gemini simulator, where engineers could run them through challenging scenarios that may happen in space, while also training mission controllers. The Gemini 3 flight was scheduled for March the 23rd, 1965, and as the launch date approached, publicity became intense. The new President Lyndon Johnson was keen to be seen with the next astronauts. America was gaining confidence about its future in space. Five days before Gemini 3 was due to blast off, the Soviet Union launched a two-man spacecraft. What nobody was expecting was another record, the world's first spacewalk. Cosmonaut Alexei Leonov left his Voskhod 2 capsule to float freely in space for 12 minutes. In the West, it was perceived as another Soviet triumph. In reality, Leonov's suit had distorted and he was only just able to get back inside. The whole mission was plagued with difficulties, but these details didn't come to light for decades. For America, Gemini 3 felt like a welcome return to space. It had been almost two years since a NASA astronaut had been in orbit. It would be the first of 10 manned Gemini missions. American media was making the astronauts household names. Achievements of the new maneuverable craft in space included the first change in orbital shape and the first change in orbital plane. After just three orbits, Grissom and Young returned to Earth. During the Mercury program, astronauts had named their capsules. Grissom had named Gemini 3 Molly Brown after the Broadway show The Unsinkable Molly Brown. NASA did not like this, as it was a reference to Grissom's Mercury capsule that had sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Barely three days after their return to Earth, Grissom and Young were at the White House where President Johnson presented them with NASA's Distinguished Service Medal. Then, something that was to become common across the Gemini missions a ticker tape parade through the streets of New York. NASA understood that the American public needed something in return for the hugely expensive space program. It gave them a new brand of hero. The next mission, Gemini 4, would be a much longer duration flight. Its crew would be from NASA's second intake of astronauts, Ed White and Jim McDivitt. They had been in training for three years. White had been practicing with a special maneuvering unit that he would use during NASA's first spacewalk. Three, two, one, zero. 
Gemini 4 blasted off on the 3rd of June 1965. After the previous flight had verified the spacecraft, this mission would work out how to use it. Soon after reaching orbit, the crew located the rocket's discarded second stage and tried to move towards it using visual cues only. But the more McDivitt manoeuvred towards it, the further away the booster got. Rendezvous was going to be harder than it seemed and Mission Control called the exercise off. There was a more important task. During the third orbit, Ed White opened the door of the depressurized capsule and using the maneuvering unit, nicknamed the zip gun, he moved into the void. This exercise had been shifted up the Gemini schedule after the success of Alexei Leonov's spacewalk. Soon, a stray glove drifted from the capsule. It would continue in orbit for another month before burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. The spacewalk was successful, except for a small break in communications. The flight director says, get back in. Jimmy Four, get back in. Okay. I don't know, we're coming over to the west end. We want you to come back in now. Roger, we've been trying to talk to you for a while here. Another first for Gemini 4 was that the control centre had moved from Cape Canaveral to a new home in Houston. And because the mission was due to last four days, it was the first time that three separate eight-hour shifts had gone into operation. There had been a problem with the computer and the hatch had been difficult to open and close, but as Gemini 4 re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, Mission Control regarded the flight as a success. But they now knew future missions would have to focus on orbital rendezvous. Post-flight honours for White and McDivitt included a ceremony at the University of Michigan, where they had both studied. At another ceremony, the President pinned NASA's Exceptional Service Medals on them. The Gemini program was just starting to deliver, but America was still not sure if they were catching up with the Soviet Union. But the future for Gemini seemed bright. Venus is just over 43 million kilometres away. Early astronomers believed it to be similar to Earth. In 2005, ESA launched the Venus Express mission. And after eight years of close observation, we now know a lot more about our planet's nearest neighbour. Surface temperatures on Venus are more than 450 degrees Celsius, and its atmospheric pressure is almost 100 times greater than here on Earth. You have clouds that are made up of um, sulfuric acid, in fact, so it's a very nasty place to be at. And the, that's one of the big questions on, on, on Venus. Why did Venus go that way and why did we on the Earth go this way? The planet takes 243 Earth days to rotate on its own axis and only 220 days to go around the Sun. and its rotation is opposite to Earth's, with the sun rising in Venus's west. In Venus's upper atmosphere, violent winds blow at speeds up to 400 kilometers per hour, and it has permanent hurricanes almost 200 kilometers across, moving around its poles. Information about the climate and magnetic field has been gathered by Venus Express since it went into orbit around Venus in 2006. It has been made available to a broad cross-section of experts. As Venus Express neared the end of its operational life, its handlers began taking risks, guiding the probe closer and closer to the planet, where it could observe in greater detail. In a manoeuvre known as aerobraking, 
the probe edged through Venus's upper atmosphere. We are going so close that we actually sense the atmosphere as a friction against uh, the structure of the, of the spacecraft. And in that way we can measure uh, densities in the, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere of Venus that we have not been able to measure for all those eight years we've been circling the planet. So we also measure magnetic fields with a magnetometer and we measure energetic particles that we find there. So it's a very new type of measurements and very valuable data we're collecting these days. In the end, Venus Express exceeded its design brief to collect a new class of information about Venus. This helps us to understand the evolution of our solar system and, with Venus being very close to the size of Earth, science is gaining an insight into Earth's possible future. Since the earliest days of flights to space, each new spacecraft had a new spacesuit designed specially to go with it. The Mercury program used a version of the US Navy's Mark IV. The Gemini astronauts wore the G3C and G5C, which were based on the suit worn by X-15 pilots. They had to cope with possible ejection and with spacewalks. The Apollo astronauts wore versions of the A7L spacesuit. It had to be able to cope with the lunar environment and protect its wearer during what often looked like hard labour. With the development of the Space Shuttle came two new spacesuits. The ACES or pumpkin suits worn by crew during launch and landing. And for work outside in the vacuum of space, the EMU, for extravehicular mobility unit. The EMU is like a mini spacecraft. It provides self-contained life support for its wearer for more than eight hours. And it was the suit in which astronauts learned in space construction techniques during the early shuttle years. The design was commissioned by NASA in 1974. And although there have been many refinements, Essentially, the same EMU is still in service on the International Space Station. It was the EMU that enabled the construction of the orbiting laboratory. The suit has 14 different layers with a range of different functions, including insulation from extremes of temperature and protection from micrometeoroids. Pressure inside the suit is about one quarter of standard atmospheric pressure. Higher suit pressures mean less mobility, but the low pressure means the astronaut must breathe pure oxygen. Nitrogen bubbles would condense in the wearer's bloodstream and body tissue if low pressure air was used. In preparation for a spacewalk, an astronaut must pre-breathe pure oxygen for several hours to purge his system of nitrogen, and this process starts before the astronaut begins getting into his suit. The upper part of the suit is a rigid shell made from fiberglass. It provides firm attachment for the life support backpack and a tool kit mounted at the chest. As part of their preparation for a sojourn on the International Space Station, mission specialists will spend long hours training in the EMU at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston. Crew members have to be prepared for unexpected maintenance tasks outside the ISS. Problems with solar panels, coolant loops and leaky plumbing have required repair spacewalks. The Russian Orland suit is also used on the ISS. It affords slightly less mobility than the EMU, but it is much quicker to put on, and its on-orbit maintenance is much simpler. The EMU was designed to be serviced on the ground. 
but ISS crews have had to adapt and learn how to open up the suit to locate problems and fix them. For complex repairs, ground specialists have even prepared video instructions for the ISS crew to follow. Leak problem. Every time the suit is put on, it is checked for leaks. While small losses are expected, any significant leak must be repaired immediately. Shuttle astronaut and physician Michael Barrett had to locate and replace a damaged O-ring. The failure of such a small part could threaten a whole mission. A new Z-series spacesuit is being developed, but evaluations will not be complete until at least 2020. So the familiar EMU will remain in service for a while yet. The 1970s vintage suit that built the ISS and kept the Hubble Space Telescope working deserves its big reputation. Three, two, unité, podium. When a probe or satellite is launched, it can only perform its function because of a complex communications infrastructure here on Earth. A craft operating in deep space sends data via a transmitter with signal strength similar to a domestic light bulb. By the time it reaches Earth, a distance measured in millions of kilometres, this signal is incredibly weak. ESA, the European Space Agency, has three giant dishes at locations around the world so it can communicate with its array of deep space probes. Sobreros is situated in a rural area west of the Spanish capital Madrid, where electromagnetic interference is at a minimum. The 35 metre dish is capable of fine pointing accuracy. Not only does the dish have to point directly at its distant target probe, it must track with it to compensate for both the probe's movement and the Earth's rotation. The 620-ton dish must move smoothly and with an accuracy of within one kilometre at a distance of 100 million kilometres. ESA's deep space dishes have to transmit as well as receive. For this, the power of the transmitter is important. A signal strength of 20,000 watts is focused into a narrow beam by the parabolic dish. The first antenna in ESA's deep space network was built at New Norcia in southwestern Australia. It's similar in design to Sobreros, the station which picks up signals from probes as the Earth's rotation takes them out of New Norcia's line of sight. Currently, the Deep Space Network has a heavy workload, as the Rosetta probe continues to transmit its own data and relay information from the Philae lander. The final member of ESA's Deep Space Trio is Malague in Argentina, 1,200 kilometres west of Buenos Aires. This is the system's newest antenna, having been finished less than two years ago. It completes the network's coverage of the sky in any direction at any time. The three deep space dishes are coordinated from ESOC, the European Space Operations Centre in Darmstadt, Germany. In addition to the deep space probes, ESOC is also responsible for communication with Earth orbiting satellites via a different group of smaller ground stations monitoring spacecraft in polar orbits. For more than 45 years, the centre has provided the link between Earth and a variety of research spacecraft. Currently, the network is controlling 13 different long-term missions. <laughs> <laughs>